So today on Lunchtime Live with the Center, we'll be chatting with our own Dr. David Schmidt, who is a lead physician here, about what goes on at the new patient visit. Dr. Schmidt, so nice to see you. Welcome. Nice to see you, Ami. Thank you for having me today. You're welcome. So t we're talking about the new patient visit, but starting with before the appointment, a patient is referred to us. They call our office and schedule an appointment. Are they scheduling a live or a virtual appointment for this first one? That's a great question. We, throughout the COVID pandemic, we've been here in the office throughout this pandemic, but we've had to um, comply with the Department of Public Health guidelines. So we are doing somewhat of a hybrid. That first visit will be virtual, but we're using telemedicine. It's a secure platform where everything's private. We have a face-to-face -face conversation, but the patients would be able to stay in the comforts of their own home. We've also had some patients that have logged in from work while they're on a break. Obviously, you need to have a private area uh, and a secure link. We do ask that they set up the team's program ahead of time so that there's not a delay with that first visit. And then subsequent visits uh, may require uh, an exam or an ultrasound with us here in the office or a hysterosalpingogram. We can talk about some of those tests that you might expect. And those are done here in the office. We are here every day and on weekends, but we'll guide you on what visits would be virtual and which ones would be in person. So we use Microsoft Teams, and that's what you mentioned as far as Teams goes. That, that's right. So there are many different platforms out there, Zoom. We've chosen Teams because it's encrypted and it's secure for patient privacy and patient information. Uh, so it's easy to use. It's fairly self-explanatory, but we do. it does require a little bit of time to download the program and set up your profile. So we ask that patients do that ahead of time. Okay. And during this appointment, so who exactly would the new patient see during this virtual appointment? Right. Great question. So our nurses are involved with a new patient visit as well, and our medical assistants may or may, uh, may, or may not reach out to you directly or to your office uh, from your referring physician. So we ask that if you can help them provide records, um, either by signing a release with your OBGYN or your primary care provider, uh, the, the, our medical assistants may contact you by phone. And usually the day of, our nurse will reach out to you by phone. So if you have a chance uh, to pick that up, that would be best. It will be a little bit ahead of the, the scheduled visit time, maybe um, as little as 15 minutes before or, an, or a half hour before. But our nurse is usually contacting you by phone to ask you some of the questions that um, with more detail from what you filled out on the patient intake. So that's another aspect of a first visit. We ask that you fill out your own history of, um, you know, any pertinent past medical history or surgical history is important for us to know. And they will contact you and go through some of that with you. And then you'd be meeting with your physician face-to-face -face, uh, via te Teams or telemedicine, just like today's uh, broadcast. And we would be able to talk to you in person, well, virtually in person. Yeah. Um, but the, the video platform is really ideal because not only do you get to see our faces, because when you come in the office, we're still being uh, compliant with the mask requirements. And even though Connecticut may lift that mask mandate, the medical providers and um, hospitals and medical offices are still most likely going to be required to be masked for some time in the foreseeable future. So, so, yeah, go ahead. So you're saying that a nurse will call ahead of time on a phone call. Right. And then the, during the telemedicine visit is only with you, correct? That's right. So the physician will be a telemedicine visit. And, um, you know, we'd like to have everybody on telemedicine, but it's it would be a very long visit that way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's sometimes not always convenient for the nurses to do the telemedicine. It, it's, um, it, it's just some, some verbal details that we need before the visit. 
And then the, the reason, the, some of the benefits of the face-to-face -face or virtual visit with telemedicine is that the physician that you're meeting with can also share some information on, by sharing their screen. Mm. We have some uh, slides that we may share with you based on statistics, fertility rates, types of infertility, different charts on options that we have for treatments. And uh, sometimes we also get records from your OBGYN that we may want to share with you during that first visit. Maybe some previous studies that were done, like a hysterosalpingogram or an ultrasound. Maybe you've had fibroids with your OBGYN that we want to talk to you about the implication of them based on the size and locations. Um, or if you've had surgeries before, we may be able to review the details of the surgery that may have implications for your chance of pregnancy. Oh, great. So, and during this visit, um, a patient's partner or spouse can also join it? Yes, that's uh, also a great point. The Teams uh, program that we use allows for a partner to be present either if you're together or from multiple locations. Often there may be one of you uh, that's working or has to be on a break uh, or, uh, or both of you are working at separate locations. We've had some people, you know, early in the pandemic, we had people get creative where somebody would be on break and drive to the other partner's location, work, place of work and meet in the car. And, and, and no longer is that necessary. Each person though would have to set up the link or share the link and uh, download the program and then log into that same appointment time. But the physician that you're meeting with can control access to that meeting and allow both partners into that same visit. Okay. And going back to who you would be speaking to, mm -hmm. speaking to a nurse ahead of time, you on telemed, finances and insurance is a big part of this. When does that happen where we, they speak to you guys, we have a dedicated financial services rep for, e for each team. That, that's right. Uh, and we try, that's a great question. We're very comprehensive with that first visit. We know many patients have been waiting a long time and are eager to start treatment. We remember it's important though for us to do a thorough job and, and do a good job and provide high success rates. We really need everything. We need records. We do need some time to complete some testing. Uh, a common question is how long does that take? And typically after that first visit, we will need about at least one cycle, menstrual cycle to complete some blood work, an ultrasound or a a dye test to flush the tubes, a semen exam for the partner, um, if it's a male partner. So typically you need at least one full cycle, but based on where our patient is in her menstrual cycle, it may be, you know, another few weeks before the next menses. So typically it can be a month and a half. Um, but as you mentioned, the other people that are involved with that first visit is our financial coordinator. They will talk with our patients immediately at that first visit, usually afterwards. And they, um, our nurses and the physician will talk about the medical aspects of, of testing and treatment. And our financial service representative will work with you and with your insurance company to check on any pre-authorization that's required, mm -hmm. uh, what will review what coverage you have, or if you don't have coverage, they will work with you on sort of self-pay rates and, and help you navigate the finances and the insurance. And then if you do have coverage, which in, it, we benefit in Connecticut as one of the few states that has a state mandate or law written, I think it was back in October of 2005, actually, that it was written that if you have private insurance, they're required to cover some testing and treatments. They'll help with that if there's any pre-authorization that's required. Okay. So in your meeting, do you, um, will you, will, would the patient do blood work before the meeting or after the meeting? And what would be discussed during this meeting? Some of the referring physicians, if they're an OBGYN, they may have already started the evaluation, um, which includes blood work. Uh, may or may not include an ultrasound or, or a dye test to check the, whether the fallopian tubes are open. That's called a hysterosalpingogram. 
or for the male partners, a semen analysis. So if any of that evaluation has been done, we certainly welcome that. We do need to get those records sent to us ahead of time so we can review that. But then if we have the records ahead of time, we can discuss those results with you at that first visit. And that's often often more efficient. But we also don't require that you get blood work or do any testing before you see us. Some OBGYNs or maybe a primary care physician may not be trained uh, to do the evaluation as some of the OBGYNs are. And they may just say, well, go see any one of us, Dr. Schmidt, Dr. Nolson, Benediva, Gro, Dr. DeLuigi, Angman, we're a large group, and Dr. Makajani. So um, it, I think you'll find all of us are great. We'll work with you, explain everything. But back to the question of, of whether you need blood work or not, if it's been done, uh, re certainly anything done recently within the year, we would love to have those results and can review them with you. If you have not had any testing done, we will outline everything we recommend to be done at that first visit. And some of that blood work can be done immediately, the same day or within the next few days. And some testing is done based on the next menses, which would happen within a few weeks. Okay. So between the first appointment and treatment, do you think it's about, I know you had said one or one or two cycles. Is that about right? Right. And, you know, the financial team would, oh, they always yell at me and say, Dr. Schmidt, don't promise anything because <laughs> uh, the, the one caveat to that, you know, from a medical perspective, we want patients to know that we will start evaluation immediately and testing okay. right away because we understand you, you know, you've been trying, couples have been trying for a while before they are referred to us and, and most people want, wanted to be pregnant, you know, months ago, if not years ago. So we will start the process immediately. Um, but some of the testing is contingent upon a woman's menstrual cycle. So we may have to wait for the next menses or bring on a menses if a woman does not ovulate on her own or get a men menses spontaneously. And then the other uh, contingency is the insurance company. Some insurance companies require that we have all those test results back and submitted from our financial service representative to the insurance company with uh, a treatment plan or um, you know, asking what services may be available and may be approved. So that process takes time to get the, all the test results. And then some insurance companies, um, the turnaround time once we submit everything is two weeks. So okay. from a medical perspective, we can usually do all the blood testing within a cycle, um, but it may be a month and a half if we're waiting for the next menses. But then remember, we have to submit those results and hear back from the insurance company on whether they approve uh, or authorize these mm -hmm. treatments or whatever we you know, recommend medically. So that can be a, up to, a, it can be immediately um, authorized or it can be a two week time frame. We do have some insurance companies that we are considered a center of excellence nationally, mm -hmm. and they may approve things right away, same day. But we do, again, we need all those test results and then we submit the plan and hear back as little as immediately to up to two weeks. It seems like there are several checkpoints. Is there a list of things that we give to patients? Is there, or how do we walk them through it? Great, great question. So after the first visit with the physician, the nurse will usually contact you right afterwards um, to answer any logistical questions, help set up those appointments that we talk about. And many nurses can also be in touch with patients via email. The physicians aren't usually emailing directly for patient privacy. We don't really have a portal set up yet that is compliant with the Department of Public Health, but the nurses can email uh, patients directly and send forms, a list of uh, things that need to be done. And they're also accessible every day uh, by phone. And we can we provide our nurses direct contact information. So if you have any questions about what needs to be done, you can call them or email them. 
lots of high touch there. Any advice you'd give to patients or any advice you have for patients during this appointment or as they're starting out? I think just, you know, trying to get all your records uh, to us is very helpful. And then being honest and open about what you and your partner, uh, what your goals are for family building or what the, uh, you know, we, we do primarily reproductive endocrinology and fertility. So we're seeing a lot of patients for assistance with fertility, but we also see patients that need surgery or have reproductive endocrine issues. So we're, we see a whole spectrum of, of types of visits and different types of patients. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what the visit is for, we ask that you are upfront and open with us on what your goals are and what the problems are. And that usually allows us to give you the best help that you may need. And would the same type of appointment apply for someone who's coming to freeze eggs? Right. Um, the uh, person that is electively freezing eggs for future fertility preservation, or if uh, unfortunately there's a patient that has been recently diagnosed with cancer, the oncofertility egg freezing, we rush obviously uh, because time is of the essence, but right. it's still important to get all your uh, patient's medical history records and for those patients that are electively freezing eggs, we still need to do uh, a complete review of, of their past medical history. It's important to know if they've had previous surgeries and we still need to do some testing to assess their potential egg supply so we can appropriately counsel that patient on what the expectations are in terms of how many eggs, how many eggs do we need to make an embryo in the future and what the chance of pregnancy is. It's based on not only a woman's age, her egg supply, uh, or her ovarian reserve. Excellent. All right, Dr. Schmidt, thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope that, hope that was helpful. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be helpful to many. Great. So awesome. All right. Thank you to those who are here, both live and on the replay. <laughs> and join us again for another Lunchtime Live. Uh, coming soon and visit us at our on our website at yukonfertility.com should you have any um, should you need any information or have any questions so bye for now bye bye <laughs>